So uh, I will talk about the uh, transfer operator transfer operators with Sinai Billiards. And initially, I was planning to talk a little bit about flows and a little bit about maps. Uh, but just like Masato, when I prepared my course, I realized it would be more reasonable to talk only about maps. So this, is, this talk will be only about the discrete dynamics. <coughs> So only about the maps and not about the flows. Okay. And um, the, uh, in particular, the dynamics I'm going to talk about, I will explain uh, today, are uniformly hyperbolic. So uh, I don't fit in the, in the topic of this conference. <laughs> because I am within uh, uh, hyperbolicity. Uh, but still, there are some difficulties. And in particular, if you compare with the courses of uh, Masato Tsuji, uh, the difference, so the difference, is that it will be in very low smoothness. So Masato talked about the C-infinity case, and as he explained, uh, uh, the results he talked about also hold in finite differentiability. Actually, they hold for C1 plus epsilon anodes of diffeomorphism. And uh, if you want to know about this, uh, I wrote a book which appeared last year that you can read if you want. But today, it's going to be much worse than C1 plus epsilon. There will be singularities. So the bad news is that there will be singularities. We have to understand them. The good news is that if, if you didn't go to Masato's lecture or if you don't remember everything, that's not a problem. It's not a prerequisite for this talk. And there was also the talk of Vaughan, which, was, uh, which is related to the present uh, 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 course, because I will talk about the measure of maximal entropy starting this afternoon. And the difference uh, between uh, uh, my course and Vaughan's uh, course is that in today and tomorrow, the expansiveness will come for free. We, we have uniform hyperbolicity. But uh, these singularities, they create actually uh, discontinuities. So we, we, we lose, uh, so the difference is that we lose, we don't have continuity. Well, in fact, you do have continuity if you want, but then you lose the compactness. So you, either you lose the continuity or you lose the compactness. So expansiveness is not a problem, but the problem will be that the loss of, a, of a continuity. Uh, expansiveness means that if you're taking a small curve, you go to a very large Uh, expansiveness, I mean, in the t it's meaning of the talk of uh, Vaughan. Yeah, yes? So the, the course of uh, Vaughan is a prerequisite. So uh, you, you need to know what is expansiveness from his talk. And in particular, uh, besides expansiveness, other things which I will take from his uh, course, I will not uh, give all the definitions. Because I will consider that you, or at least I will not motivate uh, things like Kolmogorov uh, entropy, topological entropy, and the Gibbs bounds, which will appear probably tomorrow. I mean, I will expect that you, you already have seen them, and I will not spend too much time on that. So what is, uh, what is uh, the plan? So today, I'm going to well, first remind you what is a Sinai billion map.
And by the way, so uh, I made a little advertisement for my book, but there's a book which is even more important for this talk, which is a book by Chernoff and Mark Arian, which appeared about 12 years ago, Chaotic Billiards, and uh, I really recommend this book. But it's not a prerequisite to understand this uh, mini course. <laughs> Um, and uh, today I want to do the introduction and I want to talk about transfer operators for the Sinai Billiard map for the SRB measure. And this is a paper which appeared in 2011 by uh, Mark Demers and Hong Kong John. And then um, uh, in the second and third uh, talks, so this afternoon and tomorrow, well, probably I will not finish what I want to say this morning, but never mind. I want to talk about the transfer operator, transfer operator for the measure of maximum entropy. This is a notation of uh, abbreviation from uh, Vaughan's talk, measure of maximum entropy. And this is, a, so this paper appeared in the Journal of Modern Dynamics. And this, the result about the measure of maximum entropy, this is an archive preprint uh, by uh, Mark Demers and myself. Okay. But so first, let me tell you or remind you what is a, what is a Sinai billiard map. So I forgot to say it, but uh, I'm only going to talk about the two-dimensional situation, which would be a three-dimensional flow, but I'm not going to talk about the flow. Right? So it's two-dimensional uh, map. So a Sinai billiard is uh, also called a disperse, dispersive billiard. And so it's in two dimensions. So I start from a two torus. This is my billiard table. I start from the two torus and I remove a finite union of obstacles or scatterers. And what are these, uh, what are the properties of these obstacles? So the OJs, they are closed, they are pairwise disjoint, and their boundary is smooth enough. I could get away with C2 plus epsilon, and if I put here C infinity, or if I put perfect circles, it will not simplify much the discussion. So let's just put uh, C3. And they have strictly positive <coughs> curvature. So the curvature, uh, well, it's, it's bounded because I'm C3. And it's bounded from below because of this assumption. So for example, the obstacles can be uh, perfect uh, disks. But they don't have to, okay? And uh, so what is a dynamics? So the dynamics is you have a single particle which moves in straight lines at the unit speed and when it hits an obstacle, an obstacle, you have a, a specular reflection. Okay, single particle, point particle, unit speed. So straight lines on the table, so away from the scatterers. And uh, specular, mean, specular means uh, incoming <coughs> angle equal to the outgoing angle. Specular reflections at the scatterer, so let's say at uh, when you hit the boundary. And then the billiard map, the billiard map is a map. 
So it's from gamma times the, the angle. So this is a, the angle I measure it um, with, a, with a normal outgoing normal, and I look at the, the so I have a starting point uh, on, the, on, the, on the boundary of a, of a scatterer. I look at the angle, outgoing angle, and the image of the map will be uh, the first uh, collision with a, with a scatterer. And I look at, again at the, well, I don't know which, which what this one is doing, but okay, like this. So at the outgoing angle of the image, okay? So outgoing, no, outgoing uh, angle also uh, dynamic, dynamically. Okay, so first collision map, first collision map. And uh, because of the disjoint, uh, uh, prop, the fact that the uh, scatterers are disjoint, the time between, before the, the first collision is bounded from below by tau min, first collision time. And for the moment, I don't assume finite horizon because I don't need it for the result of Demos and Jung, so it, it's bounded by tau max. But tau max could be equal to infinity for the moment. Okay, so this afternoon I will assume finite horizon. Okay, so I will use some uh, uh, notation. So R is arc length along this, uh, this finite union of uh, boundaries. R and phi is, uh, is this angle that I, that I uh, discussed. So this is an invertible map, okay? And this set, uh, maybe I call it M, this set is compact. Uh, t, t is invertible. But as I said already, uh, before, the, the, the problem that we have to face is that the map is not continuous. So T, T is not continuous on M. And this is because of the grazing collisions, also called the tangential collisions, uh, which create these continuities. I hope you can see it from this picture. Usually I try to explain it on the picture, but Ian makes fun of my billiard pictures, Ian Melbourne, so I won't try it today. And so what are these tangential collisions? Well, the tangential coll collision, because of the convention for the angle, it's when the angle is equal to plus or minus phi, uh, plus or minus pi over two. Okay? So if I call uh, S1, or less, more generally Sn, is a union of T minus J of S0, J equals zero to N, and can be positive or negative, then the map is continuous from S1 to S minus one, and T minus one is continuous from S minus one to S1. Continuous. Oh, sorry, sorry, what am I saying? Sorry, no, you, you have to remove S1, of course. M minus S1, M minus S1, S1 to M minus S minus one, like this. Now this set is not uh, this set is not uh, invariant. It's not compact, okay, but it's not invariant. And if you want to have a map uh, to find a set on which t is continuous, 
and in fact, even uh, differentiable C2, what should you do? You should remove uh, from M uh, the union of the S end. Okay, and this is a union of compact curves. It's a countable union, countable union, countable union of closed curves. So M prime has full measure, full Lebesgue measure. But this cur union of curves, I won't prove it, but it's dense. Okay, so the singularities are really all over uh, the place. And so these are the, the tough uh, facts about the billiard. And one uh, maybe remark that I can make, maybe I leave it as an exercise. You can show that T is piecewise one half fold. And the reason I'm, so this comes from the fact that the, the map is a C2. Just think of the example of the, of the perfect disks. And the reason I make this uh, uh, remark is to point out that uh, when I say that uh, the map T is continuous or piecewise C2, piecewise C2, when you remove the singularities, it's piecewise C2, but the derivative can blow up at the singularities, right? Because the derivative of square root is one over square root. Okay, so there is an intrinsic uh, modulus of continuity uh, in this um, story. So I have the bad news on, on the right, so not put the good news here on the left. So the good, there are good news for the billiard, but uh, as I said, uh, it shows that this talk does not belong to this conference because the good news is that we have uniform hyperbolicity in a very strong sense. So of course there are points where the derivative is not defined, then you cannot talk about the derivative, but whenever the derivative is well defined, you have the invariant cones. So there exists invariant stable and unstable cones. And actually the cone fields are completely trivial. I mean, they are, they are constant. Constant cone fields, they are, they are, they are uniformly uh, transversal. The, 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 the slopes of these lines depend on uh, kappa min, k min, k max, and tau min, I won't write the, the formulas. And so these cones are invariant in the usual, usual sense that if you take dt, then map cu strictly inside itself, you have contraction. Uh, did I write it? No, x has to be an m prime for the derivative to be defined. And when you look at the, the stable cone, it's mapped into itself by backwards, sorry, backwards uh, iteration. And in fact, we have uniform hyperbolicity. There is a uh, hyperbolicity uh, exponent, which you can write a bound for in terms of the minimal curvature and the minimal time between collisions. And you have uniform expansion uh, along in this unstable cone. So I take an adapted metric, right? Otherwise there's a constant here. I don't want to worry about the constant. So this is for any vector in the unstable cone. And I also have uniform expansion in the uh, past. if I take a vector in the stable cone. 
So I will call the properties on this back blackboard property one. And this, as I said, is uniform hyperbolicity. Okay? And so this uh, ensures that you have uh, stable and unstable uh, bundles. And stable and unstable uh, manifolds. So they are not going to be defined everywhere because they are the bad points where the derivative uh, does not exist. But they are going to be defined almost everywhere. And, um, and the problem is that the stable and unstable uh, Cannot get this one. Ah. So the stable. Okay. <laughs> yes, the stable and unstable. Interesting. So the stable and unstable bundles are only, only measurable. They are not holder as, as we have usually uh, in uh, Anosov systems. And the stable and unstable leaves defined are defined uh, almost everywhere instead of being defined everywhere. Each leaf. Uh, is C2, but the, the, the foliation is only measurable. Sorry, almost and everywhere with respect to what measure? Lebesgue. Okay. Lebesgue, yeah. And um, for the moment, that's the only measure I have, but yes, Lebesgue. And uh, each leaf is C2, but you, the thing you have to worry about is that the, the length is not, I mean, the length is finite and it's not uh, bounded from below. So the length can be very small. Okay? Sorry? Constant. I mean, it's, it, there is a. Uh, okay, so an exercise. You can find the, the condition. It's a condition which only depends on kappa min, kappa max, tau min. And it gives you the slopes of these four lines which are on the blackboard. And if you can do, cannot do the exercise, just look in the book. <laughs> they are constant. I mean, it's really completely trivial in, in that case. So the cones are constant, but the, the, the manifold, they move inside the cone in a crazy way, okay? Okay, but now, okay, Lebesgue measure. Lebesgue measure is very nice, but it's not invariant. So which is a, a absolutely continuous invariant probability measure? It's almost Lebesgue. So I guess that's also an exercise. It's cos phi, cos phi d phi dr. And you have to normalize, and uh, apparently the normalization factor is twice the length of the boundaries. So this is absolutely continuous measure. You can check that this is the correct normalization to give a probability measure. And you can check that it's invariant. And you can look in the book if you, you cannot do this exercise. OK, so for the moment, I didn't quote any, any names. But now let me quote two uh, uh, theorems to end this introduction. So two theorems, two classical theorems about the, the Sinai billiard uh, map. So the first one is, of course, due to Sinai. That's really uh, classical. So it's easy to check that this measure is invariant. For the billiard flow, actually, it's a Liouville measure itself, which is invariant, right? So I mean, to find a, an absolutely continuous invariant measure is, in this setting is, is not difficult. But what is not trivial is, is to show that this measure 
is the only absolutely, let me tell you what it means here, absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. So there are lots of other invariant measures, but if you, if you require absolutely conti absolute continuity, this is the only one, the only absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. And in addition, mu is Bernoulli. So Bernoulli means that you are conjugate to a Bernoulli shift. And if you don't remember what, what is a Bernoulli shift, you just need to remember that this implies mixing. And of course, everybody knows that mixing implies ergodicity. And actually, there's another property which I use, which we use in the paper, but which I probably won't have to talk about even tomorrow, which is K-mixing. And Bernoulli is stronger than K-mixing. And in many settings, actually, you prove first K-mixing, which implies the top things. And then you show that although the implication from K-mixing to Bernoulli is not true in general, if you have enough hyperbolicity, you can, you can prove this implication. OK, so that's what I proved. And then let's move to uh, what seems to be, for me, very recent. But for the young people in this audience, this is already classical, right? So it's a result by Lai Sang Young, 1998. And she used, she proved it, uh, and, that's, and that's a very famous paper where she introduced uh, what, what is called now the Lai Sang Young Towers. So she, she introduced some symbolic dynamics. I would say the result uh, formally, it's an exponential mixing of this um, SRB measure. But before I state the result, I want to mention that there is a, another proof, and that's a proof that I'm going to describe uh, today, because it uses a transfer operator without any symbolic uh, uh, tool, symbolic dynamics. So the new proof, which now is getting also old, but OK, still. Uh, it uses an intrinsic transfer operator. So it's a new proof of the exponential mixing that they will state uh, right now, but it gives other stuff. I mean, it, it, the advantage of using this, uh, so new proof, and let's just say n frills. And what are the frills? Well, the frills are that you, ca you have stability. You can prove stability of the, uh, of the measure of the, well, the measure maybe here is not very interesting, but of the rate of mixing. You can prove a central limit theorem. You can prove almost true invariant principle. And you can use this technique to study the billiard flow, to show exponential for the billiard flow, which is a result I'm not going to talk about, OK? So this, uh, this new proof with a new tool gives added stuff, OK? But the theorem I want to state right now is only the exponential mixing, which probably many of you, you already know. So it's exponentially mixing for holder observable. So you fix a holder exponent, and then you get the rate of mixing, which is smaller than 1. And what does that mean? It means that for any pair of holder functions on this compact a manifold, there exists a constant such that the correlation function, so psi 1 composed with tk psi 2 d mu srb minus psi 1 d mu srb psi 2 d mu srb decays like this prefactor, so psi is psi 1 psi 2, right? Psi 1 psi 2 times the rate of decay to the power of k for all k bigger than 1. So this is exponential decay of correlation. OK? So that's the end of the introduction. And now, and now I want to talk about the, the proof of this uh, result of demos and uh, and Zhang. And uh, the main reason I want to talk about the proof 
is because the result I really want to talk about, is, which is a result about the measure of maximum entropy, it also uses a transfer operator. And uh, in the proof of Demers and Jung, we will have a transfer operator, we will get a spectral gap. For the measure of maximum entropy, and this is a spoiler, we don't get a spectral gap. And I want to try to explain why. I mean, what's the difference between the two uh, uh, transfer operators and uh, why it's harder to get a spectral gap. And for the moment, it's not possible. And I think it's, well, it's just a guess, right? But I think it's never going to be possible to get a spectral gap for the measure of maximum entropy. OK, anyway, so now let me talk about this uh, paper of Demos and, and John. So now I talk about the transfer operator for the SRB measure. And this is this paper of Demos and John. So OK, what's the transfer operator? Well, let's just, can just write it. So it's like some in the talk of, uh, of uh, Masato. I compose with the inverse dynamics, and I multiply by function big G, which was big G in Masato's talk. And here, big G is just the Jacobian, or the inverse, the Jacobian of the inverse map, so 1 over the Jacobian of the map times t minus 1. So this, of course, is only defined almost everywhere, but that's fine. You can, for example, let it act on bounded functions. Well, no, it doesn't preserve bounded functions. Though. Well, I mean, let's just say you let it act for the moment on measurable functions. But one thing you can, you can check from the definition is that uh, the dual of this operator just because you have a Jacobian here preserves, this is a Lebesgue measure. OK? And let me just uh, uh, point out that the determinant, what is a determinant? It's basically the cost divided by the cost of the image. OK? So this is a transfer operator. So this is something that you can check because you have the Jacobian here. This is Jacobian with respect to Lebesgue, right? And another you can check if you know this, or once you have checked this, once you have checked that this is a formula for the Jacobian, you can check that the operator itself preserves the function cos phi. OK? And this is what we want. I mean, we want to have when we uh, introduce a transfer operator. We expect the transfer operator to have as a fixed point the, the SRB measure. So that's good. But what we want, um, what we want to get exponential mixing is to get a, a space, a Banach space or Hilbert space, on which the operator has a spectral gap. So the strategy. And let me emphasize that, as in the talk of uh, Masato, T is hyperbolic. So we, we want to avoid the Lysangian approach or we reduce to an expanding map. Okay? So the strategy is to find a space. So for the moment, there is no way to construct a Hilbert space, so it's just going to be a Banach space on which this operator is bounded and has a spectral gap. And I will explain what I mean by spectral gap. And just like in the talk of uh, Masato, you cannot do that if you take a space of functions, OK? Because of the hyperbolicity, because the hyperbolicity means that t minus 1 is going to contract in certain, is going to expand in certain directions. And so b will be a space of distributions.
Okay, BB will be a space of distribution, so it should be anisotropic. There will be smoothness in some directions and no smoothness in the other direction. I will give you the definition uh, in a moment. I just want to make some, to continue making some comments. So in the talk of, uh, of Masato, so in the talk of Masato, He gave us a micro-local definition, meaning you have to go to the cotangent space and take the Fourier transform, you go to a cotangent space. And this is, uh, I mean, historically, I mean, there's this paper uh, that I, I wrote with Masato. And now there are a lot of people uh, Also uh, in the uh, semi-classical semi communities, or I think, for example, there was a paper of Yatlov and Tversky, which was mentioned yesterday. So this approach is very successful when you have enough regularity, okay? And today I'm going to use uh, a different construction, which I, I can call geometric. And I'm not claiming that uh, the, the, the definitions give rise to the same space in certain cases. I mean, nobody knows how to prove that, and it's probably not true. And this geometric definition, uh, historically, it comes from a paper of Blanc, Keller, and Liverhani, I think 2002. And then it was developed uh, by Guezel and Ivarani in two papers. And this was for the Anosov setting. And then there was a paper of Demers of Ivarani in dimension two. So this was general dimension. The paper of Demers and Ivarani was for piecewise hyperbolic. So introdu introducing the possibility of to have discontinuities in the map or in the derivative. And for the moment, there is no good microlocal definition which allows to handle singularities, okay? There are some uh, definitions which work in restricted settings, uh, and I have a plan to, to, to develop a, a construction uh, about a year ago, I gave a talk where I thought this plan had crashed. Uh, it is alive again, but I don't have the time to work on it right now. So let's say that there is no uh, microlocal definition yet. Okay. So for the moment, if we have singularities, the only definition which works well is this geometric definition, which I'm going to give in a moment. Uh, yes. I do expect actually, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to prove it. But only for the SRB, not for the maximum entropy. So for maximum entropy, you think that this is I think it, there, there is no holomorphic extension, but I don't know how to prove it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now let's uh, let's give the definition of the of the space. Maybe I should first tell you precisely what I mean by uh, spectral gap. Although I guess everybody knows. But, uh. So what is a, what do I mean by spectral gap? What is the main theorem in the paper of Demos and Jung from which they can get the exponential mixing? And by the way, uh, there are also, I mean, the people from the semi-classical, like if you talk to Sjö Strand, I mean, he will mumble something about Melrose and uh, make some computations, but for the moment, they don't know how to make it work yet. And also some people tell you that, yeah, but you can get a billiard by taking an analog of flow and then like pinching it. And uh, But the problem is that when you take the limit, everything, you know, I mean, nobody knows how to deal with these ideas. There are ideas, but for the moment, there are no proofs that I know of using the more analytic approaches. Okay, so what is, uh, what is the theorem of the spectral gap? So, um, 
Okay, so there is there is a Banach space B such that LSRB is bounded on B. Its spectral radius spectral radius is equal to one. The essential spectral radius Uh, is smaller than something which is strictly smaller than one. And one is a simple eigenvalue. And the only eigenvalue of modulus equal to one. So what does this mean? This means that you have a unit disk. So all the spectrum is in the unit disk. So the, the cos phi function, this Banach space con contains C1 function, so the cos phi function is in the Banach space, so the, the eigenvalue that we found is, is there, the fixed function that we found is, is there. It's simple. No other eigenvalues on the, on the unit uh, circle. And we know that the um, essential spectral radius is strictly smaller than one, which means that outside of a, of a disk of radius strictly smaller than one, the spectrum is discrete, isolated eigenvalues of finite multiplicity. So we, here we have the resonances. And uh, because they are isolated, uh, this means that there is a gap, right? There is a gap. So did I forget something? No. And maybe let me just say one thing. Until uh, six months ago, uh, well, I was still making, I, was, I have been making this picture for years. <laughs> but until six months ago, there was no example uh, where we could exhibit non-trivial resonance. So the eigenvalue one is there, we, we know it. But there was no example where you could say, OK, but there will be also some other eigenvalues. So, and so last year, he didn't finish writing the paper yet, but Damien Tomin found an example, example of billiard with non-trivial non -trivial resonances. And Frédéric No uh, told me recently that apparently, um, independently, uh, Damien uses an idea that he had used in a paper with uh, Jacobson and uh, Soares uh, in a slightly different setting. I mean, the idea is to use some coverings, and, but okay, I, I can't talk about this. I don't have the time. Okay, so now I, uh, well, I won't have the time to tell you about the proof. So once you have this, you have exponential mixing, right? This I don't explain. I won't have the time to talk about the proof, but I think I have the time to give you the definition of the norm, but I'm not sure I can get the blackboard. Okay, let me try the last one. So I'm going to give you the definition, a uh, geometric definition of the Banach space. And, uh, and then I guess I will have to stop. And so this afternoon, I will tell you how you can prove things with this uh, definition. And actually, as usual in this uh, setting, you have actually two spaces. You have the space B, which appears in the statement, and you have another space, which is bigger, meaning that the norm is weaker, so that's why it's called weak. And it's weak enough that this embedding is compact. And this is basically the same idea as this compact perturbation idea, which appeared in the talk of uh, Masato, except that it, instead of talking about compact perturbation, you talk about Dublin-Forte inequality or Lazotayoc inequalities, but it's the same thing, right? What does it mean to say compact over an inclusion set? I mean, the unit ball for this norm is compact for, for in that space. Yeah, that's what it means. 
And so both spaces will be defined, uh, both spaces will be defined, uh, so they will be spaces of distributions. But the way you, you do it is you define by taking the completion of C1 functions on M, so that's a very nice space that everybody knows, for, uh, well, the norm, just norm for B, and the norm, maybe I just put one bar, weak, or maybe I just write W for, uh, for B weak, right? So I will introduce you the, I will give you now the definition of the weak norm and of the strong norm, the full norm. And to get the distributions, you take these functions, but you complete under this norm, meaning that in the end you end up with objects which are not functions, but which are distributions, okay? Okay, and now the main two, I told you it was a geometric definition, what's geometric about it? So you start with WS, what is WS? It's a space of, uh, I don't know if that's a good notation because, uh, well maybe I try to put a blackboard uh, W. So these are the stable manifolds, these are stable manifolds. Um, but not necessarily uh, complete, I mean not full length. Let me write in words, then I don't have this problem. So W stable subset curve, let's say C2 curve, subset of a stable uh, manifold. And I don't want them to be too long. So are, that's why I say sometimes we don't take the full manifold. But they can be arbitrarily short, right, as, as we know. And I think I, there was something else I want to say, but I'm going to cheat, so I skip it, okay? So, uh, okay, but there was something I have to say. If you look at the paper of Dermas Zhang, or if you look at the uh, papers of Gweza Liverani, they don't work with this. And somehow that's the whole point of their approach. They want to have uh, stability results, perturbation results. So they want to have a space, a Banach space, which works for two nearby billiards or two nearby anodes of flows. And of course, if you take uh, the, the stable manifolds of an anode of flow, they won't be stable manifolds for the other anode of flow, even if it's very close. So instead of doing that, they take stable uh, curves or manifolds, which are in the stable cones. Uh, sorry, they take curves, uh, smooth curves, which belong, or smooth manifolds, which belong to the stable, who, the derivative of which, at any given point, belongs to the stable core. But we can, and Demers and Jung also do that. But the reason I change the definition here, and I go back actually to the historical paper of Blankel or Liverani, this is what they did in Blankel or Liverani, is because for the measure of maximum entropy, we have to do that, okay? So this is not what you will find in Demers Jung or in Demers Liverani or in, this is what you find in Blanc Keller's Nivani, so the prehistorical paper. But we have to go back to this prehistorical definition for the measure of maximum entry. Okay, but now let's me, let me tell you what is a weak norm. And again, I, I cheat here, but I guess nobody will notice. So I take the supremum over all these uh, stable guys. And then I take the supremum over all Holder function, and I have to tell you what is this. Maybe I shouldn't call it alpha because there was another alpha before, but it's a different alpha. And what do I take? I integrate, so this is a, so this is a curve, right, a, a C2 curve. And I should say, you, you, when I say C2, you take um, C bar and uh, C2 bounded by C bar, right? The derivatives are bound, uniformly bounded. So you take this C2 curve, so this is a function defined on a C2 curve, alpha hold on this C2 curve, and you integrate it with respect to the Lebesgue measure on this curve, or arc length, so I mean Lebesgue, basically, okay? And now I have to tell you what is alpha, okay? So again, it's not the alpha which was in the statement of, they're not related, these two alphas. 
So this alpha I can take any alpha I like, as long as it's not too big. And if you look at the paper, you will see one third. So in fact, wh where does this one third come from? It comes from the one half. I told you there's a one half, which is an intrinsic uh, modulus of continuity. But it also comes, why do we get one third and not one half? It's because there is something which I wanted to talk about this morning, but I'm already over time, so I will talk about it this afternoon, which is a homogeneity layer. And this afternoon, I will tell you what is homogeneity layer, and you will see that there is a decay there. And the traditional decay is 1 over k squared. And when you put these two numbers together, you get 1 third. Okay? And if you're a little bit more uh, clever, you put here 1 over k plus epsilon. And then you can get here as close as you want to 1 half. But uh, let's not worry about that. Okay? So I just want to say that this is almost intrinsic. This is, you can improve it a little bit, but you cannot go beyond one half. So this is really intrinsic. So this is a weak uh, norm. And uh, sorry, I think I have to stop. Huh? Sorry? Ah, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, sorry, of course you integrate f. Thank you, absolutely, yes. Thank you. Now I'm getting nervous because I'm over time. So let me just say, I, I won't give you the, so it's like a cliffhanger, right? Cliffhanger. So uh, I will give you the afternoon of the strong, the definition of the strong norm this afternoon. Let me just mention, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is it your superpower as a chairman? <laughs> so uh, I just say one more thing. So when I say I view this as a distribution, so it's a little bit abstract, okay, you take the completion, but if f, if f51, well, first of all, you can check that this supremum is finite, it's not very difficult. If the function is c1, you can integrate it against any Hölder function and you get something which is finite, then this, then this is finite, so any c1 functions belong to the space B we, and how do you view it as a distribution? So the associated distribution is a, uh, I don't know how you, I want to call it. maybe I use f also, but no, I don't give it a name. It's a function which associated, uh, let's say, psi twiddle to psi, sorry, f psi twiddle d, d Lebesgue. Okay? So what I'm saying is that when you take the completion, you get a space of distributions because I mean you only require that the function that the that the, sorry that the object can be integrated against a smooth uh, enough function on the unstable on the stable manifold. But if what you start with is a C1 function, it's in the space, and then the corresponding distribution is just integrating with respect to Lebesgue. Okay, but now I really have to stop. Sorry, I continue this after. Yes, but then the spectral gap becomes very small. So you want to take as big as you as you want, as you can. Need some more questions. So you say you expect uh, uh, you expect uh, for uh, SRB measures you have um, full asymptotic expansion, for example, for correlation function. I mean, not full in the sense of uh, Mazato's talk or Malo's talk. I mean, there, there will be a, I, I don't, I, I still believe that there is a limit that you cannot cross okay. over, right? Yes, I still believe that. I could be wrong, but I still believe that there is an intrinsic limit. Yeah, okay. But I, I also believe that the, the, the gap that you see here will also appear in the, in the zeta function. This was your previous question. Wait. No, yeah. my previous question was exactly this one. Yeah, well, now you answered my previous question. Okay. Does the banner space is indeed the completion of C1 or, yes. or not C1 half? Because, because the transfer property is not continuous in C1. 
Okay, you're right, I'm cheating here. I mean, but you don't want to know the real reality. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. You have to do something more clever, and uh, the fact that the, the C1 is not preserved, you have, but you can, I mean, you can also define it like this, and it works, but you have to do something, which I don't want to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> but which is explained in their paper.